Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for our webinar, Optimizing Combeam CT Physics and QA Testing, Prospectus on Imaging Equipment Calibration. Before we begin, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar will be recorded and available through our website. To minimize noise and distraction, all attendees' phones have been muted. However, if you have a question or comment during the presentation, we encourage you to submit it using your Q&A box. We will do our best to address all questions and comments at the end. I will now turn the presentation over to our moderator, Dr. Philip Patton, Rad Site's Chief Physics Officer. Thank you, Patty. And uh, again, welcome everybody to today's session. We uh, at Rad Site kind of thought it'd be interesting to uh, sit down with some of the physicists that are active in the field of uh, CBCT and just discuss some topics that we thought were interesting and maybe people had questions about. Our, our first uh, member of this roundtable is Dr. Mason Anders. Uh, Dr. Anders graduated with his PhD in nuclear physics from Texas A&M in 2015. Uh, he currently resides in Texas and he works for West Physics, which he joined in 2017 uh, as a medical physicist. Prior to that, he uh, did postdoctoral research at University of Texas Southwestern. And again, that was in medical physics. Our other participant is, is Joseph Mahoney. And uh, Joseph uh, has been a consulting physicist for over 15 years, uh, specializing in diagnostic and nuclear medicine. And he has an extensive background in performing QC testing uh, on all, all modalities, but uh, especially CBCT. He founded Grove Physics, um, but currently he is the Vice President of Diagnostic Physics for Versant Physics. I want to welcome the two of you um, to the group, and I appreciate you giving, giving me the time and agreeing uh, to come on and, and just kind of discuss this, what we think is important. So the way, way this roundtable is going to work, we, we kind of got together and we discussed some of the topics that, that we stumbled through or, or had to work through uh, when we first started dealing with CBCT. And we thought other people would be interested in kind of seeing what we've learned on our way. So the first area, um, and, and it's pretty straightforward, is uh, what's the difference between um, traditional CT and then cone beam CT? And, and, and what challenges uh, is presented by that? So Joseph, um, what's your experience uh, dealing with that? What's some, what are some of the challenges and, and you know, some of the differences that you had to overcome? So obviously cone beam or fan beam CTs, they're both generating a, uh, they're acquiring data on a 3D volume that can be viewed on screen either as a 3D reconstruction or as slices. Typically your fan beam CTs are uh, located, they're, they're large units that take up a pretty big room in a hospital typically where the patient lays on a bed and the scanner stays in one place and the scanner uh, scans multiple times continuously as the bed moves through the machine versus cone beam CTs tend to have a much smaller footprint. Um, the bed, there's not a bed that moves through the scanner. Typically the scanner would only make one rotation but it's able to acquire a pretty nice uh, volume because it uses a, a much wider flat panel um, detector than a, a regular fan beam conventional CT would do. Um, tends to be a slower rotation. So where a conventional CT scanner might scan um, one rotation per second or two rotations per second, the cone beam CT typically might take um, you know, anywhere from 10 seconds to 30 seconds to go all the way around and create one rotation. So that creates um, some issues that you wouldn't see so much in conventional CT, um, specifically one of the challenges I know for patients is, is making sure that the patient stays very, very still through the course of that whole um, acquisition. The benefits to that, um, once again, it does have a much smaller footprint, doesn't require near as much um, space or uh, electricity requirements. It can typically go in an uh, outpatient office, uh, generally has significantly lower dose than a conventional fan beam CT would have, and um, less training is generally required for the operators. And from an imaging standpoint, the uh, cone beam CTs tend to have 
very good resolution compared to conventional CTs. Uh, traditionally, low contrast detect detectability and soft tissue contrast are not really known for its strengths, but uh, from what I understand, there are actually some applications coming out for mammography. So um, I, I believe this is a evolving technology that um, is improving all the time, but um, essentially those are my initial thoughts. Mason, in, in your experience, where do you see most of these CBCTs located? Um, uh, most of them I see are in ENT clinics. Um, that I've seen less, less often in like orthopedic clinics as of now, like scanning feet and ankles and knees and sometimes arms. Um, but that's growing uh, for the orthopedic and even a bigger slice that's growing is in dental practice. Yeah, that's where I've, I've been seeing it mainly in dental. Yes, in dental, they're, they're replacing just dedicated panoramic machines with combined comb beam CT and panoramic uh, machines. Yeah, so that's where and, they take advantage of that very high contrast, I mean, sorry, higher resolution of cone beam CT combined with low dose makes it really well suited for dental applications and any kind of sinus work. Yes. Yeah, and, yeah. Then, and when the low footprint that you discussed, uh, Joseph, it, it makes it ideal for those type of settings because you know you're not taking up so so much uh, room geometrically. So, um, well, with that in dental, because dental's not really regulated uh, a great deal in the physics community, um, what's the importance of physics and QC testing of this uh, in your mind, uh, Mason? I'll let you start. Let's see, uh, it's it's very important because uh, medical physicists make sure that the image quality is acceptable. Uh, and there's always a trade-off between image quality and dose. So we don't wanna to give too much dose, that's a bad thing, but we also don't wanna to give too little dose because then you just get a poor image and you're giving someone a dose for no good reason. So medical physicists are key in making sure that we have that right balance and having a good image quality with the appropriate uh, level of radiation dose given to each patient. And and I kind of, I'm going to go back to dental again. It's a little bit difficult to um, relay that importance to some of the dental facilities because their dental units typically are not evaluated frequently by a medical physicist. So you kind of have that little bit of a pushback or a little bit of education that you have to do. And is that what you're seeing as well, Joseph? Uh, yeah, I would say, I would agree with that. Um, I'd also say that because of, this is a, it's still evolving technology and because there are so many different applications that there's not really one gold standard of quality control testing versus um, if you take conventional um, CTs in hospitals, they're all similar enough that there are, uh, are existing phantoms that have been used pretty, um, pretty universally for the last 15 years. Uh, the, uh, the cone beam CTs, a lot of the, the fields of view are not um, big enough to image uh, this, this whole uh, ACR Gamex phantom that's been typical in, um, in the medical Next field. Slide, yeah, it, so it, it, the QC programs are all pretty unique, um, the recommendations by the different manufacturers. So back to the, the question of why is the physics and QC testing important? Um, you know, part of that is that you need somebody who um, is who understands the uh, the importance of the tests, the uh, specifics of the tests for different machines, and also um, sometimes there's there's some judgment calls. Sometimes it's you're comparing apples to oranges and knowing say what that trade off what trade off is acceptable, like Mason mentioned between dose and image quality. So um, that's that's something that physicists are uh, trained to do, and that that. Um, uh, I think it's really important to have a physicist in the loop for some of those decisions. Yeah, Patty, next slide for us. So you actually kind of started talking about our, our next question that I was uh, going to bring up, and that's the variability between the cone beam CT units. And I was part of the uh, initial group that looked at trying to set up standards for testing this. And I was quickly uh, shocked at how many various units there are, how many different types of units, how specific they were for a particular acquisition, how they, they vary greatly on 
the way they did certain things, the way they did their QC. Uh, can can you go over that a little bit? How, what's your knowledge of that, or or how do you see that? Yeah. So once again, yeah, the um, manufacturers all have such different recommendations, and compared to conventional CT, once again, we've got a higher resolution expectation. So where in a fan beam CT, you know, seven millimeters or seven line pairs per millimeter might be acceptable resolution. A lot of the cone beam CTs expect like 16, 15, 16 line pairs per millimeter. So there is a higher resolution expectation, but there's also at the same time, usually a less restrictive, low contrast, um, like soft tissue essentially um, um, specification. So we would typically look at CT number accuracy for several different materials and the tolerance ranges for cone beam CT tend to be wider. Um, there are, um, I guess, other another um, issue, another reason why the traditional fan beam CT um, QC methods don't don't really apply themselves as well is uh, there, there's something called cone beam artifact, which yeah. uh, essentially what you can the way you can think of it is if you have many blinds and they're all um, oriented horizontally and you look you can see straight through the mini blinds in one direction, but if you look up or down, they're they're blocked, and so you can't really tell for sure that you know, the, uh, the slit goes all the way through. So something similar happens in cone beam CT because the x-rays are only coming from one point. You're not, you're not making a picture and then moving a little bit and then making another picture the way you do in conventional CT. So there's some of the concepts that you would otherwise use like slice thickness in fan beam CT really aren't applicable, but that's a, a few, a few of the, the differences. Mason, uh, you, you got any that you want to add to that? I mean, the manufacturers, they have different ways of doing the different tests, but they all test like a uniformity, noise, CT number, linearity, accuracy, high contrast resolution is, is obviously very important. Uh, some manufacturers like Zoran, they do have low contrast uh, detectability in their testing, but other manufacturers do not test it at all. And it's not in their QC requirements. And in our physics reports, we put in there explicitly that this is not required by that specific manufacturer. Um, and so from what I found is machines, when I test them, they, in general, they all seem to pass almost all the time. And the image quality is, is typically very, very good. So. Yeah, one of the, the biggest challenges I had when I first started looking at CVCT Obviously, you start from CT and look at what's been established in the past and then try to, you know, adapt it to CBCT. And the biggest challenge was, as you stated, uh, manufacturer A would measure a parameter completely different than manufacturer B. And not only would they do that, they would have different ways of um, or different passing scores for those. And, but you're right. They're measuring the same physics or same physical quantity. But the, the approach they used was was quite different. So that, you know, quickly it became obvious that there's not a uniform phantom that was already out that could be used for each one. And so now you're having to kind of go back to the manufacturer's phantoms and see if they're going to adequately give you what you need and then kind of do your testing based on that. So that has been a challenging part. And I'm glad to hear that the two of you kind of have the same experiences where you know, you had to default to the manufacturer and, and then look at how they addressed it and then tailor your testing for that. But in the end, you're getting the same, you're getting the same types of measurements that you're looking for. So the next slide, Patty. So uh, Mason, I'll let you go ahead and start this one. Uh, what are some of those key physics measurements for cone beam CT? You, you mentioned them, but I'll, we'll go ahead and summarize them all. And then Joseph, I'll, I'll let you follow up. Well, so states treat cone beam CT differently from state to state. And uh, some states like Texas treat it as like a, a normal X-ray radiographic machine. And so they only require a survey every two years instead of every year, like a CT machine. But some states like Arizona, they don't have cone beam CT really mentioned at all in the regulations as of now, and they treat it like a CT machine. Um, so it's really important to go by what your states require uh, make sure you have a medical physicist who's really, you know, in tune with what the regulators require. But, you know, I also encourage, you know, if there's any state regulators out there, 
uh, listening, you know, go to the CRCPD Conference of Radiation Control Program Directors website. They have su suggested state regulations that treat comb beam CT differently than CT because they're just not, they're not meant for the same, uh, CT and CBCT are not meant for the same application. Comb beam CT is meant for dedicated applications where CT is more for general applications to the whole body. Yeah. And, and Joseph, on that, um, what are some of the challenges you found uh, measuring the dose? And, and I'm just actually, I know we're gonna discuss some of, some of them a little bit later, but currently when you're measuring a dose, what type of approaches do you take? And then we'll, we'll kind of explain why you take those in a little bit. Okay, so there's not necessarily a, a consensus at this point, the best way to, to measure this. I, I do prefer to measure, um, to at least make an attempt to measure CTDI which is not, um, you know, CTDI is based on, you know, fan, fan beam geometry and it's dosed to a phantom. And there are certainly some challenges when uh, to, to do that. So in a, in a hospital, say in a, uh, a fan beam situation, you have a bed, you can put a phantom on the, on the bed, chamber in the phantom, you know, typically you would use a, a 10 centimeter long chamber and you would irradiate the center of it. And because of um, the large distance from the tube to the chamber, there's not a lot of divergence. You, you, you have a pretty good idea how much of that chamber is being irradiated. Um, and so that is a, that's, that's one of the challenges for cone beam CT. The other thing is, if you're trying to measure cone beam CT in a situation where it's a, it's a dental x-ray, it's a sinus x-ray, where the, the patient literally sits in a chair and the CT rotate or the, uh, the tube and detector rotate horizontally, not around a bed, um, it, is, it is a challenge to try to get a phantom up um, into the right, right place. The way I do it personally is I will, um, I will build up, I'll, I'll put my um, you know, suitcases or whatever books I can find to, to in the chair and build it up um, to you know, about uh, chest level, uh, shoulder level where a patient would be. And then I take a three ring binder and open it up set it on top of the suitcase, and then I put a 16 centimeter CTDI phantom on top of that in a way that, you know, the, the 16 CM phantom is in, is in position that a head would be in so that when, it, when the um, scanner revolves around, you know, you're able to get those measurements um, at the center and at the periphery. Um, another, um, another challenge and difference between measuring CTDI for cone beam CT versus um, a con conventional fan beam CT is a lot of times it's not a 360 degree rotation. A lot right. of times it's, yep. it's a 180 degree rotation. So if you follow the, the standard um, AAPM, I think it's TG96, um, well, the, the traditional uh, method for CTDI measurement, you know, you would make um, a measurement at the center hole and then like say one at 12 o'clock, or at least that's the, that's the ACR standard. Um, you would make make three measurements at the center, three at the edge. Well, if you only make one, if you only measure the periphery at one point, then you're either going to overrepresent or underrepresent the dose if it's a 180 degree sweep, depending on whether the, the tube passed over that side of the phantom or the other. So, I, I personally think it's important to to measure all four peripheral points. So, what I do when I test um, tested in that situation, rather than taking three measurements at the center and then three measurements at 12 o'clock, I'll do one measurement at the center, one at 12, one at three, one at six, and one at nine. So five measurements total um, is, is the way I would, I would typically do that. And then I would weight the, the outer measurements, the peripheral measurements, average those together, and then weight those at two thirds and the center at right. one third, um, essentially the way the ACR does it, um, it except for the fact that, that I've made four peripheral measurements instead of one. So that, right. I don't think it makes sense to you guys. Yeah, no, um, it, it's definitely challenging to measure or to, to, to describe, capture uh, the, the shape of the beam or, or characterize the, the beam, whether that's, uh, you know, dose measurement or what. It's difficult just because of geometry. But, and that kind of leads us into some of the regulations for the states and accrediting bodies. Like, so my experience with some states, um, they require you to test a CBCT at the very beginning, you know, uh, the initial installation, and they ignore it after that. Um, and one of the things they always want you to capture is they, they want you to capture like half value layer or KVP, 
not necessarily does. And then you start to try to figure out what, what, is, what are we trying to do here? Again, that kind of goes back to maybe we're treating it like a dental unit. Uh, and and I, I test in several states and I know both of you do as well. So what different state regulations have you seen that are just completely different than, a, than another one, another state? Next slide, Patty. Mason, you wanna? Well, this, this might, um, I, I see there was a question that came up in the, in the uh, comments about how do you measure CTDI volume on a small yep. volume? Uh, this, this uh, I don't know if we want to save this till the end or I can go. No, ahead. no, no, now's the time. Okay, yeah, so um, what, what I've got here is on um, the, the left box, you've got two fan beam geometry uh, scenarios. And so what you're looking at the, the edge on of the fan, you're, you're looking at the short direction of the fan. The, the left situation, you have a, a typical 10 centimeter long ionization chamber that um, you know once again as because because the tubes far from the measurement point and because the the beam is thin there's um, there's not a lot of difference between making a measurement at the isocenter versus measuring it at the periphery in both situ both positions you have a pretty good idea how wide that beam is and you're able to extrapolate that out as if the entire detector was was irradiated um, and the other thing is it's not difficult to position that beam that um, because you've got a narrow beam but a long chamber, it's not it's not hard to get that um, ten centimeter right. long um, chamber into that narrow beam. So in fan beam situ uh, situations, the long chamber is is uh, well suited. That's that's a good choice. The other the other uh, situation here on still on the left box, but the the right situ the right uh, um, picture. I'm showing a smaller farmer chamber, you know, which is, is like less than a centimeter long. And it's very difficult to position that just right so that it's completely inside a fan beam geometry. So the a farmer chamber would be a poor, cho a poor choice of ionization chamber to measure the, um, to make any CTDI measurements on a fan beam geometry. So. If we move over to the right box now, though, we're talking about a cone beam geometry where you have a very wide x-ray beam. And in this case, a short detector like a farmer chamber is a better choice than the, the long 10 cm chamber. So um, on, on the left situation, again, we've got the, the 10 centimeter long chamber, but in, the, in, in this one, you can see on the, um, the near side periphery of the uh, the phantom, you may or may not have the entire chamber inside the field of view, and so it um, you know the the tube is much closer to the phantom or to the the head, so there's a lot more divergence, um, and so if you use a 10 centimeter long chamber, you may or may not be getting an accurate measurement, um, versus in the right uh, the, the far right situation, if you use a farmer chamber, it's very small and it's easy to get that small chamber completely inside of the, um, the, the fan beam geometry. And um, so that's the, the, for a fan beam, a, a farmer chamber, a short chamber is actually a better choice. And I can refer you to a few, um, there was a, I think. A well, we lost you, Joseph, you hit mute somehow, not Okay, yeah, so I'm not sure. So yeah, to back up a you're, few seconds. You're referring us somewhere. Yeah, right. So um, so for, uh, for cone beam CT, a small chamber, like a farmer chamber at the center ray of the cone beam geometry is, is the best choice of chamber to use. And that's consistent with AAPM task group 111. And if you look, um, Robert Dixon and John Boone have a really good article in the Medical Physics Journal in, in 2010, kind of explaining that, and they show um, that it's uh, that it's equivalent. So that's um, hopefully that answers. Um, and then the you question. you do a correction by the active length of the of the detector. Well, see, you don't need to do the correction. See, if um, in a with a 10 cm chamber, you're actually correcting. You know, if you if you uh, break down the 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 ACR spreadsheet that calculates CTDI, yep. you know, the, um, it's important to know your detector width and the number of detectors, you know, the, the N, N times T versus if you're totally inside the x-ray field, 
you don't need to do that. You don't need to do, um, you know, 100 millimeters divided by n times t to to create that that uh, correction factor. So it's actually a little simpler complication or simpler calculation because n dot t is not a uh, it's not a consideration. And, it, and once again, this is all uh, laid out really well in uh, AAPM TG 111. And if you find the uh, Dixon and Boone article in medical physics, um, I think I had the name written down. I think it was, um, yeah, cone beam CT. Well, if you, if you look for cone beam CT dosimetry, if, you, if you're a physicist and you have access to the AAPM, um, the medical physics journal, I definitely recommend that article. Yeah, this is some of the same things that were first being uh, looked at when we started going to the very large number of detectors from in conventional CT. Uh, especially uh, Toshiba, you know, when they started doing a wide one that was going to be more than the, the 10 cm chamber. And you're on mute again, Joseph, somehow or another. Um, so next slide, Patty. So uh, Mason, in, in your experience and, you know, traveling through the different states and, and looking at CBCT, what, what type of variabilities have you seen and, and what, some of the states that have some of the best regulations that really capture what we need or what we, we believe is needed for cone beam CT. Can you address that? Yeah, so if you, I mean, it, it, it's lower dose than CT, but if you have a high patient load, it's still important to, to do, have a shielding design done and have like a radiation protection survey done. Uh, some states like Texas require a radiation protection survey for a cone beam CT. They don't require it as of now for dental CT. The, the requirements are just a little less. Um, but with dental CT, I'm seeing, you know, as they're transitioning away from panoramic to more cone beam CT uh, exams, I think that's something that does need to get looked at for dental is requiring a shielding design and radiation protection surveys. So the best states require all of that done, like they require the shielding design to be turned in before construction even begins on the CT suite. So, um, but some of the states just are require, just have less requirements. Yeah, I, I agree hundred percent, Mason. Um, I, I know I've been to several dental sites where they've say removed a, a, a traditional panoramic X-ray and they put in a CT and they, um, or, you know, one of these cone beam CTs and they do produce significantly more scatter and you know, if I come in and do an area survey, um, I've, I've had a few sites that were surprised that, um, you know, they thought it was, you know, basically a one-to-one -one, um, replacement and that it wasn't going to produce significantly more scatter and that the additional lead shielding in the walls was not going to be necessary. But I definitely, um, anybody um, on this, uh, anybody listening that is a, a dental office uh, that you're replacing a pano with a cone beam CT, I definitely recommend you have a shielding specification done so that you don't find out after the fact that you're going to need to to go back and do a renovation and uh, add lead shielding to the walls it's it's something that i've seen more than once yeah yeah i yeah, i've seen that as well the common question i'll get is uh, hey i'm replacing this i'm assuming i can just swap it out with a cbct and and, and they're really shocked when you say no it's not that easy of a transition um, some more things have to be answered first. And in particular, uh, we have to look at the shielding requirements if there are going to be any. Uh, so there's some education opportunities there as well. Again, that's primarily in the dental suite. And, and I, I don't want to sound like I'm coming down on the dental suite. It's just their, their uh, x-ray experience is really low exposures. And, and so that's what they're familiar with. And now when they're going to a cone beam CT, the exposure values can, can climb up because of the number of of patients. So with, with, with a shielding design, normally, almost always you have a, a, a barrier for the operator, a lead, you know, shield barrier to protect the operator. Whereas with some of these dental practices, sometimes just there's not even a door, it's just an open space right. on the wall. And the button to push it is right next to that open door. And oftentimes they'll just stand right in front of the open door to watch the patient be scanned when at minimum, they could just add a little mirror up on the wall to look at the patient from around the corner. And just by doing that, you reduce your radiation. I mean, you know, if you're right in the open space, sometimes I measure, you know, 150 uh, uh, millirincan uh, 
on the on my survey meter, but just around the corner, you drop it down to five just by doing that one small thing. So you know, I'd really encourage people to think about uh, radiation protection when they're doing when they're doing their exams. Right. So um, one of the questions that just came up is, well, what's the value of annual physics testing by a licensed third-party physicist for cone beam CT? And that is actually one of our questions that we, we kind of skipped over a little bit. Uh, and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll answer part of it and then I'll, I'll go to you. One of the values is obviously uh, several states require it. And um, rad site to accredit the, the unit also requires uh, the physics testing. And so it's mandated kind of for those uh, so that's one of the values. The other value is, again, you're, you're getting into a more advanced modality. And so now you're making sure this modality is performing the way it should perform. And, and that, that is just a, a benefit to the patient and uh, to the facility. So in, I'll, I'll let you, one of you two go ahead and answer that as well. Um, again, only the low tech ones are not really mandated to be tested right now, like an x-ray unit or a dental unit. And, and a CBCT is, in my opinion, is definitely not a low tech modality. Yeah, I think that's uh, definitely, I would say the, the biggest benefit to having a physicist involved and at least at an annual testing level is the dose measurement. Because yeah. while most of the manufacturers will have their own um, manufacturer specific QC and um, it's automated to different um, different levels um, you know it, they may um, the manufacturer may come and do some some quality control um, as part of their um, their preventive maintenance but the the dose measurement is something that I think is is definitely worth having a third party involved with because this is a significantly more radiation um, producing modality than, than either intraoral or panoramic or, um, you know, so, you know, one example is a uh, fluoroscopic x-ray is um, almost every state that, that I'm aware of requires annual dose measurements on fluoro. And I would say cone beam CT produces if it, it, at least as much, if not more radiation than fluoro does. So, um, you know, whether or not you see the value in a um, another person who's uh, trained in uh, quality control coming in and putting their eyes on, um, you know, your quality control, and the that's specific to your cone beam CT. Um, whether or not you see the value in that, I think that the dose measurement is absolutely something that a physicist needs to be checking routinely. So on that dose, one of the uh, one of the attendees asked. Have you ever measured DAP instead of the CTDI? Just, be, you know, one because of the it's easier to measure than CTDI. And I've actually uh, thought about that a great deal about should we move away from a CTDI measurement and how we want to actually determine what the exposure is. Uh, have either one of you um, looked at measuring something other than CTDI, in particular, in this case, DAP? Uh, good. Yes, yes. For for care stream machines, we, we've moved exclusively over to measuring DAP. We used to measure CTDI, but uh, we found just for like reproducibility reasons yep. and just to make the fit, the uh, the survey more robust, we, we we decided to go in the direction of just measuring dose area product because we can put our de detector right in the middle of the detector on the machine. And it's very reproducible. It's very easy to set up. And it's very easy to train physicists how to do it well. And we, then we can, and the, the machine gives uh, DAP directly on the machine. So we can compare apples to apples with, with our numbers. And then we can convert the DAP to an effective dose based on research by other medical physicists who've, who've scanned like uh, phantoms and, and done dose measurements. And then we can compare that effective dose to say an effective dose given with a conventional CT machine. We can show how that effective dose is much lower and is good by comparison. Yeah, I, I know a lot, of, a lot of people who just prefer to do it that way because, uh, because of the ease of setup. Um, you know, I, I wonder, um, 
and and there there may be I don't know Mason or do you know how um, if if you were going to do like an effective dose estimate based on a DAP from a, a cone beam CT I don't know has there been any uh, research I'm, I'm not I'm not I'm just asking because I don't know honestly if there's a if there's a good way I know that um, you know for for CT um, you know there are uh, you know ways to convert you know a, a DLP to you know the effective dose based on the you know ICRP tissue weighting factors and and so forth, but uh, maybe that's maybe that's an opportunity for more research if anybody's looking for a, yeah. a research opportunity. There, there there are some research papers out there uh, uh, that they've done the research to to convert DAP to an effective dose, mm -hmm. and they, they give a they give a bit of an error range. It's probably not as exact as using like a DLP method. The K factor, but even within that range, I, I think it it still shows that even if you go with the the most conservative high dose effective dose that it could be, is still much lower than a conventional CT. Sure. Yeah, and so back to the you know the third party question, I think as the we get more and more experience measuring different quantities for different machines, we'll start kind of narrowing in to a set of tests doing a certain way and either it'll be um you know vendor specific or or we'll kind of get to where we can actually be uh the vendors will start moving toward being consistent with other vendors about how they do things i do see that this is the way it's going because like you're saying uh you want to do what's best for for the patient you want to make sure you have patient safety you want to make sure you're optimizing uh the actual exam um, so as we get more and more experience in that, I do see the third party physicist being a, a primary role uh, doing this on an annual basis. I'm going to, I, I venture to state that uh, states are going to start requiring that on an annual basis for the ones that are not. And as that happens, um, there'll be a lot more experience uh, or a lot more attempts at measuring dose where we're using a DAP method or, or another method and, and, and we'll kind of come up with a consensus uh, way. Uh, it's like everything else, you know, initially you start out looking to see how, how the best way to do it. And then you, you just kind of figure it out as you go along. And I, I think that's where we're going. Yeah, but I, I think do think it's very important that we uh, tackle those topics and start looking at those. And which is, uh, I'm not sure how many cone beam CTs each one of you do. I know, I know it's more than the number I do, um, but, five years ago, I did none. And, and now, you know, it's a, a, a good percentage of the work I do. So I think Mason, it's a, a much higher percentage of the work you do than, than I do. But again, five years ago, I, I didn't really do any. So that's how new we are at testing it. So yeah, I think any um, new modality until, you know, the technology of it eventually kind of plateaus is going to go through sort of an evolution of, um, you know, what is the proper QC and what can a standard be? I think, you know, if you go back, you know, gosh, probably 25 years or something like that, when, you know, multi-slice CT was um, new, that was an issue then. Um, mam the digital mammography sort of went through a, uh, and arguably is still going through something similar where the different manufacturers are all different enough that there's not one, or not until recently, was there one set standard? They all had their own individual standards, essentially. Yeah. So I think that's just the stage we're at now in the kind of CT. And so for like like curve beam machines for orthopedic, the the patient stands like on a little table, like a little circular table, and that's we still do CTDI for that because that's very easy to set up. You just set it right, right. there on the bottom right. where the feet go, and it it aligns perfectly, and you can get your measurements, you know, pretty easily. So yeah, it's easy just feet, to reproduce it. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. Because I've, I've done some kind of like the mess method you've done, Joseph, where I've kind of stacked up and I, I measured some values and they're, you know, 80% different than the year before. And it's all because of geometry or something. I had to go back and look and look at exact geometry I, I did the year before. Uh, and so, yes, some of those are difficult to reproduce. Um, yeah. So one of the ones we we're talking about shielding. Uh, and you mentioned that people, you know, some of the technologists are standing outside of the wall. I've seen where they just had curtains. And so with that, what's your thought about uh, the, the technologists being mandated to wear dosimeters or 
Do you think it should be left up to the state? Uh, how, how, what's your opinion on that? Well, I, I think there can be a happy middle ground where for the, say for the first year or two of use of the machine, they can, they can wear, they should wear a decimeter to see what the dose is and have best practice. But if the dose is so low that it's virtually zero, you know, I, I, I can review the data and, and I feel comfortable writing a letter, you know, basically saying, you know, unless your patient load increases by a bunch, you're safe to discontinue use. But it may still be good, a good idea to have like one area monitor like on a wall just to see what the dose is doing over time. Yeah, one thing I think is worth being really careful about, though, is, you know, as we mentioned, just, you know, stepping into, say, an open doorway versus being around the corner, you know, you're going to go from, you know, almost zero dose, you know, over on one side. And if you, um, you know, behind the wall and if you stopped wearing a dosimeter, um, you could potentially get complacent and right. you know, peek out around the corner more and more often over time. Um, so if you stop wearing a dosimeter, uh, you probably want to make sure that at least you have a policy in place. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe some signs posted. Well, you, you should, if, if you're not using dosimeter, you should, you should probably at minimum have an operator barrier in place to where it's, it's, you know, it's, it's reproducible where you are every time when, when the machine is going. Right. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, there is some comfort to have that dosimeter say, oh, wait a minute, my dose is high this, you know, this quarter. Uh, what, what have I done different? And then kind of, yeah. some because, people, go some ahead. People go months and months without getting any reading. And then all of a sudden they get a reading of 200 milliram and just you think, well, what, what happened this month, you know? And Yeah. And uh, another question we had uh, was, and we kind of discussed shielding a little bit, but this one was, what type of setup would you recommend for checking the shielding of a dental CBCT installation? So if, if so, Mason, if you were tasked with doing a shielding design and it's a dental facility, how would you go about doing that? Um, well, I mean, you, you, we need to have an accurate uh, layout of the room and the adjoining rooms. So we take the distances and the occupancy of the different rooms. So if it's right next to an office, where a person's gonna be sitting almost the whole day, we assume they will be there. That's, that's gonna require more shielding. Whereas if it's an exterior wall, especially if you're on the second floor, you know, there's not gonna be anyone outside. Uh, it's gonna require a lot less shielding. So when you're, when you're ordering a machine, you really need to think about where you're gonna put the machine in your office. And, uh, and so it's all about distance and the patient load you're doing, the number of exams. And then based on that, how much shielding you're going to need in those walls to reduce the scatter radiation down to an appropriate level. And then you might want to consider having a leaded window too, so that the, you know, technologist can stand on one side of the wall and be in visual contact with the patient while they make the exposure without, you know, sticking their head out. Cause once again, these are long exposures. They're, you know, 10 to 30 seconds, some of them. So um, unless, unless you can see the, the patient that whole, that entire time, you don't know whether they've, you know, bent down to tie their shoes or, or, or what. Um, so I, I definitely think it would be worth uh, looking into having a leaded window in your control barrier. So uh, I haven't done shielding for a CBCT uh, in a dental office. I, I know in traditional CT, you're provided with the dose lines from the, from the manufacturer. Uh, so is it your experience? Again, this is just from my own ignorance. I, I don't know. Are the manufacturers providing those for you when you're having to do these? Yes. So I personally don't do the designs, but our, the, the people who do the designs at our company, they're given like the isodose maps yeah. of the machine. They use the isodose map method to do, to do shielding designs for some manufacturers. Yeah. And, and so it becomes very similar to a CT at that point. Uh, like you said, a distance occupancy use factor and you know, type of thing, okay? So, and the last question that we actually came up with, uh, next slide, Patty, is, you know, there are uh, a couple of agencies that are uh, crediting CBCT now, uh, and, and RADSITE is one of those. Uh, we, we, we felt that it was uh, important to uh, include this modality in, in the process, and so, uh, I, I'm a strong believer that it promotes patient safety. Uh, it also 
uh, verifies the quality of the scans. It, uh, it also makes sure that on a routine basis, the, the quality control is being performed by, by the location. Uh, as the states, in my opinion, are, are behind and, and some of the other organizations are behind at, at doing this quality control or, or checking on this, I think a crediting agency has the opportunity to look at that. And, and that's why I kind of was part of the RAD site development of it. And so I, I find that's the some of the most important part of the accreditation process is they have the annual physics. So someone's actually on site checking on a regular basis that yes, the technologists are doing as they're supposed to be doing, uh, the, the machine's performing the way it's supposed to be performing uh, and the patients are safe. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, is, is the Cone Beam CT machine, it's, it's, it's becoming to be seen as a higher modality. And so it, it's by becoming accredited uh, through an accreditation uh, like RAD site, uh, it, it helps, especially like insurance companies understand that, that these modalities need to be reimbursed at a higher rate. And uh, it's really important to have an accreditation body that requires a medical physicist because the medical physicist can make sure that there's a good quality of care for the patient in terms of image quality and that the patient dose uh, is appropriate. And so just having that uniform standard across medical practices, you can have that seal of approval on your practice saying, we are meeting the highest standards. Please come to our imaging center. Please come to our ENT clinic. You don't necessarily want to go down to the street to the guy who's not having his machine checked out every year. And one of the other questions that came up in the, in the uh, Q and A was, where do you see actually uh, the QC going? You know, uh, do, do you see that we're actually going to be heading toward a uniform phantom that all the, all the vendors uh, will be using or that, that a physicist can use on all, all the different vendors? Um, and what are your thoughts about that? I know personally that if we get to that point, it would make our life a lot easier because you can set up a certain way of doing things and you do it on each one. Uh, and it would not be like mammography where you go in and you perform, you know, two hours over testing on one machine and, you know, an hour on another or whatever. So it would make it all standard. What, what do you believe uh, is the future there? And, and what are your thoughts on it? Well, I, I definitely think a uniform standard is achievable. Um, once again, the biggest hurdle at this point is just the size of the uh, the standard fan beams phantom now it's it's um you know more than 120 millimeters long it's it's a uh, you know it's it's too big to fit comfortably inside of a lot of cone beam cts versus the cone beam uh cone beam phantoms provided by manufacturers those tend to be um you know pretty small you're talking about you know probably you know six centimeters unless it's a uniform phantom in which case it might be larger but that's, I think that's definitely something that's achievable. And there have been some vendors who have produced, um, you know, sort of first attempts at that. And uh, up to this point, they're, they seem a little lacking um, in, in my perspective, but you got to start somewhere. And so I think that, I think we are moving in that direction. Mason, has it been your practice with your company? Have y'all, have, you, have you, your company moved to a certain phantom or a certain setup or, or? No, we, we, we use the manufacturer uh, required QC because in certain states like Texas, Texas requires that you use the manufacturer QC specifically unless the manufacturer declines to do QC, to offer a QC method, then it's up to the physicist to determine an appropriate method. So until, until something more uniform becomes more standardized and states start requiring it, um, we'll probably stick with the manufacturer QC methods. Yeah, I, I agree. It'd be nice if we could first target the dose symmetry component of it and at least get to a uniform method of doing that with a uniform phantom, uh, something that would be ideal. And then we can look at a QC because it's pretty easy to run the manufacturer QC. And like, and like we said earlier, you can get the values you need to actually properly assess the unit uh, based on their phantoms. So, um, is there any anything else that you, you think I, I haven't targeted that you want to discuss about this uh, rapidly growing and advancing modality? Um, 
where you see it in the future or, or where you hope it is in the future or, or the physicist's role with it? Well, it's, it seems to be growing rapidly because especially like ENT clinics and orthopedic clinics, they can get reimbursed uh, uh, to their clinic rather than sending their patients out to a different imaging center. And uh, they can have direct control over the images and image quality that they, that they need for their, to do their diagnostic work instead of uh, sending it out somewhere else. Yeah, and it seems to be popping up in um, a lot more in surgery and interventional labs where a traditional C-arm that would just normally do fluoroscopy. Now, a lot of them are capable of doing a, a 3D cone beam reconstruction. Um, I think just about all the major vendors now have, have C-arms with that capability. So it's exciting to watch it grow. And um, as, as new applications pop up, once again, uh, you know, I've recently heard uh, that uh, it has uh, there's there's somebody looking into mammography applications for cone beam CT. So um, it is um, it, it's certainly uh, an exciting field to pay attention to. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, th I think it's it's probably the the fastest growing modality right now. I, I may be wrong on that, but that's just my opinion. Uh, some of the other ones have already kind of plateaued, and you know have we understand quite well their capabilities and they've gotten there, but I'm not sure that we completely know where cone beam CT's capabilities will end up being and when it's all said and done. But Well, gentlemen, um, there's no questions on the Q&A and we're uh, slightly under the time that, that you promised to me, but I really appreciate the two of you taking the time to kind of just discuss this topic with me. I, I know you're busy and, and uh, I just think it's a really important area uh, for medical physicists to be looking at right now. And that's why I reached out to kind of see if we could just have this little discussion. Um, so again, thank you very much for your time. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Yeah, just great day. a reminder, today's webinar has been recorded and will be available through our website. And if you enjoyed this presentation, be sure to check out the webinar page on our website for past webinar recordings. We hope you will continue to join us for upcoming webinars. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patty. Yeah. Go ahead. End it. Yeah. Click the record. End it.